Hello, welcome back to my channel. So, side note, it's that time of year where my sinuses just suck. So if I sound tired or like I'm struggling to breathe, it's because I am. But please just deal with it because I have to. Anyways, if you follow me on Instagram, then you might be aware that on the week of Thanksgiving, I had the pleasure of going to Las Vegas for the first time with my best friend Sage and their family. This is not a Vegas vlog or anything like that. If you do want to see that, that should already be up on my side channel. If not, it'll be up like soon after this video. But anyways, on our last full day in Vegas, myself, Sage, their brother and parents, parents, there was five of us, went to Zach Baggins's Haunted Museum. And um, yeah, I have stuff to say about it, hence the video, because it was kind of really weird and kind of bad. And just a heads up, uh, whenever you enter the museum, they make you turn your phones off. So if I am able to include pictures and videos, just know that they're not mine. And also, before we get into it, if you're not a believer of the paranormal, don't waste your breath telling me in the comments. I really don't care. Either suspend your disbelief or, like, leave. Because this is a video of someone who is an adamant believer of the paranormal reviewing a haunted museum. So, like, what are you doing here? <laughs> but before we get too far into this basically critique on capitalism. Let's take a second to talk about capitalism and anti-monopoly, brought to you by the Better Internet Initiative. The holidays are just around the corner. It's kind of scary how fast they're coming up, and for a lot of us, that means that we're making our lists, checking them twice, and getting some holiday shopping done. But what you might not know is that a lot of large companies use this time of year to enact self-preferencing more than any other time of year. Self-preferencing is when companies basically promote products to you that make them the most money. So when you're on Amazon or Walmart or Google shopping for your holiday gifts for your nephew and you get a product recommended to you based on what you've been shopping for, it isn't recommended to you because it's the best in the category or the most bang for your buck. It's because that product in particular will make that company the most money and in a lot of cases, it's also their own product. So essentially, those big names that I mentioned earlier use their dominance online to unfairly promote their own products and make themselves more money over competitors and small businesses that are distributing through their websites. So if you're like me and you think that that sucks, you might be wondering, how do you combat this? Well, by shopping small. Small business owners account for more than 64% of new jobs in the USA, but sadly, over 20% of those companies fail within their first year. The main reasons for which being lack of support and visibility, which those megacorps only contribute to by pushing themselves over everyone else. So when you go shopping, remember that buying locally can help directly support your neighbor and help people achieve their business running dreams. And if you're more of an online shopper and you don't really know how to navigate and find small businesses online, it's actually kind of simple. You could literally search like, insert interest here, merch. You can explore websites that are made to promote small businesses. And honestly, sometimes small businesses will just show up on your social media feeds based on how tailored your feed is. For example, and I'm not kidding, I feel like this like sounds scripted just because of the timing, but it's real. So I'm filming this on December 2nd. Yesterday, I was scrolling on TikTok and I got a video on my For You page of a small business that makes their own anime merch and they were promoting an upcoming drop that dropped today, December 2nd. And it was this kind of subtle Chainsaw Man merch, which if you don't know, I really, really like Chainsaw Man. So before I started working today, I remembered that it was December 2nd and that this merch came out and I went and I bought one of their hoodies and I supported a small business. Long story short, you have the power to support small businesses and contribute to anti-monopoly this holiday season. And I really think you should. <laughs> Thank you for your time and let's get back into the video. So let's get into it, starting with some backstory. Zach Baggins, if you don't know, is a 45-year-old paranormal investigator born in Washington, D.C. and lives in Nevada, Las Vegas, Nevada. He is most well known for the wildly popular show Ghost Adventures, in which he hosts and leads investigations alongside Aaron Goodwin, Billy Tolley, and Jay Wasley. Wasley. I don't know if I pronounced those names right because I haven't seen the show. I was a Ghost Hunters gal not a ghost adventurer's gal. 
Sorry. In an article from Mental Floss, Baggins says that he has been experiencing the paranormal basically ever since he was a kid, and he would explore these, like, abandoned mining towns in Nevada as he was growing up, and it kind of inspired him to try to make a documentary, which would turn into the show Ghost Adventures, which first aired in 2008 and is still airing to this day and has also occurred many of spin-offs and movies and whatnots. Now, you might have caught on to the fact that I said I am an adamant believer of the paranormal, and I am. I'm a diehard. I am, however, not a diehard adamant believer of Zach Baggins, just to get that little bias out of the way, okay? And it's not something against Zach personally. I'm just very critical of shows like Ghost Adventures because, like, it's not real. Sorry. That's not to say that every encounter on that show or shows like it are fake because I don't know that and I don't even like think that. However, with the rarity of capturing the paranormal on tape and with how easy it is to fabricate capturing the paranormal on tape, there's without a doubt in my brain 0% chance that every paranormal experience on the over 200 episodes of that show are real. I can't be convinced otherwise. I'm sorry. It's just not real. But with all that being said, I am very, very sincere and genuine when I tell you that I did not take any of that skeptic energy with me into this museum, because I went in with, like, not much knowledge on the museum at all. The only two things I knew about it was that, one, Zach Baggins bought this place and put a bunch of haunted stuff in it, and two, this is where Post Malone had that experience with the Dybbuk box. And that's literally it. So I was actually really, really excited to go to the Haunted Museum because it wasn't like a guided ghost hunt or anything like that where you were using like tools that could have been pre-programmed or manipulated or set up, you know? It was just haunted items and the stories behind them. And that's not really something you can fake. I mean, sure, you can lie, but I put at least a little bit of faith in Zach that he wouldn't do that. And when we got to the museum, we had to sign this waiver that said if we experienced like nosebleeds or fainting or bites and scratches that we couldn't sue or anything like that. And as we stood in line, there was this TV playing uh, clips from the Haunted Museum show that they made. And it was showing like, different experiences that people had in the museum and all the scary things in there. And so me and Sage were like, okay, damn, like this is, this is legit. We could get, we could get bit in there. We're at the uh, Haunted Museum of Zach Baggins. Zach Baggins is Haunted Museum, the guy from Hello, Ghost Zach Adventures. <laughs> I can't have my phone in there. So you guys won't see what goes on in there, but we just signed a scary waiver that says that we cannot be upset if we get scratched, bit, or burned. I hope that one of those things happens. <laughs> I'll let you know. And again, I was I was super excited. I wanted to have an experience at the museum. So then we meet our tour guide and no shade to her. She was cool. No shade to like any of the workers in this video, FYI. I'm critiquing the museum and I'm critiquing Zach, but I'm not like critiquing the workers just trying to do their jobs. So anyways, the tour guide takes us into the museum and to the left, like this room right to the left of the front door. And there's, it's just like this room that is covered head to toe in creepy dolls and figures. And it looks cool. We're feeling the ambiance a little bit. It's getting kind of creepy. And the tour guide is explaining some stuff about, you know, the length of the tour, how VIPs can go into certain areas while us broke people have to just watch them do that. Um, and then she says something along the lines of, like, the real Zach isn't here because he's working super hard day and night, like, to catch ghosts or something, but he's with us in spirit. Something like that. That's obviously not verbatim. And she turns to one of those, like, Zoltar fortune-telling machines, but it's of Zach Baggins. And an audio recording plays of him giving us a cryptic introduction to the first attraction. And I did think that that was weird, but also... It's his museum. Some people are there for him more than they're there for the ghosts. So it's not really like that big of a deal, even if I did personally find it kind of corny, just because Zach has a very particular way of speaking that I find funny, but that's just me personally. And that's not like really why I have such an issue with the museum. But something I also discovered pretty early on that I actually do think is a somewhat valid criticism is the idea of the VIPs or as they were called the RIPs because get it. R.I.P. It was made very clear from the beginning that R.I.P.s would be getting some special treatment because they paid more for the lanyard and the free shirt that's not free because you paid more for it. And no, I know that I do have a little bit of a flat tone, but just so we're clear, I'm not like bitter 
that I wasn't an RIP. Had I known it was an option, I honestly would have like asked or sent Sage's mom money to like upgrade to the RIP. My critique of RIP isn't based on like personal FOMO, but rather my disdain for, for one, capitalizing on the dead and creating false exclusivity. And also for the price of $80, which is what the RIP costs, it does not seem to be worth it to be an RIP at all. So the RIPs get their free lanyard and their free t-shirt, and according to the website, extended access on your tour, including off-limit areas. However, this extended access was, to my memory, like three and a half rooms that they couldn't be in for longer than two or so more minutes because they couldn't leave the rest of us just like standing around. And really only one off-limit area seemed worth the RIP pass if they were able to actually explore it for more than 45 seconds, which they weren't. The first RIP exclusive was right at the beginning of the tour. After we were in that room to the left, there was a walkway where you could enter another room that was full of creepy dolls that apparently some of them were haunted and the rest of us just like watched them walk through the room. They didn't really stay in the room. They just like walked through it. The next thing is when we were in this room for some like cult that had a ritual where to have you like face your own mortality, the cult would make its new members stare into the eyes of like a real skull for hours. And when the tour guide was done talking about like the cult and everything in the room, the RIPs were able to crawl into this like little crawl space. It was just a crawl space. And in it, there was a human skull that they could like look at as if they were doing the ritual. But you can't be in there for more than like 20 seconds a person because the rest of the RIPs have to stare at the skull too. And also you can't leave the broke bitches, AKA me, out there for too long. So, you know, hurry it up. There was also a true crime room, I think, which we weren't able to see because the non-RIPs were in a separate room being introduced to Dr. Death because one of the attractions there is Dr. Death's van. But I remember being confused about it then and I still kind of am now because we had already been into a true crime room that had artifacts from Richard Ramirez, Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Manson, those like really popular killers. I check back my footage to see if there was a mentioned distinction between the true crime room and the special true crime room, but um, I don't have any footage because according to the Haunted Museum, our electronic devices interfere with the spirits or some ghost hunting equipment that was placed in some rooms or something. I guess it's a really good thing that the spirits don't mind the flat screens in almost every room for Zach to pop up and tell you how much he spent on a random chair you get to look at for 13 seconds. Or the strobe lights and fog machines. Or the door rigs that the staff use to scare you. Or the whole clown haunted house segment. I can only assume that we were asked to turn off our phones so we couldn't capture our disappointment on film and so we can't show people things for free so they don't have to spend $50 in two hours for the museum. But anyways. Then there was one thing that I actually do think is a good idea for a VIP experience, which was the haunted basement of the haunted museum because Fun fact, the museum itself is like a haunted house that Zach bought and transformed into a museum. And we learned a little bit of history about the house, including the fact that the basement was like the most haunted room in the house and that apparently a family that used to live there had a dad that would do satanic rituals or something in the basement. So it's said to be a paranormal hotspot and even have some demonic activity. Now, I didn't see what was actually in the basement because while the RIPs went in there, the rest of us just kind of like stood above the stairwell twiddling our thumbs, but from what I overheard from the RIPs on our tour, it was a basement, you know, but with some like scary non-haunted decor here and there. Speaking of decor, let's talk about that because fuck it, I'm, I might as well nitpick. We're already here. The decorations are very cool. Many of the rooms in the house are lined wall to wall with weird dolls and paintings and taxidermy, and it's cool. That is a sincere comment. I was enamored by the first room of the house. But while it did make for some cool ambiance, it also seems like a good amount of the decor is more so compensation for the lack of any substantial exhibit in the museum. And it can also be kind of distracting when the puppet in the corner of the room is more interesting than the haunted piece of plywood on display. The decorations actually lead into two larger comments that I have about the museum. For one, the museum doesn't really know what exactly it wants to be. And for two, the museum is just a place for Zach Baggins to brag about the weird shit he spent too much money on. But I will develop both of these ideas towards the end of the video, so let's just like put a pin in them because I have some more things to pick at. 
this next segment, I will just be calling exploitation because that's what it is. There were multiple instances throughout the tour where I, as well as Sage, just kind of went, this feels weird and kind of wrong. The first of which was a room with a haunted bed and nightstands. Yeah. The bed belonged to Dennis Hoff, who was a pretty popular brothel owner in Vegas that died in the bedroom in 2018. The reason I bring up the bedroom is because it's not haunted. Like, it's it's just not. I'm not trying to be rude or skeptical. It's just straight up not haunted. Zach himself, in the video playing on the TV, doesn't even tell you of a haunting that occurred there, but rather takes two tragedies and tries to link them in an implication that the bed itself is cursed. So some of you might know this if you are tuned into sports and or pop culture, but in 2015, ex-NBA player Lamar Odom overdosed on a mixture of drugs, causing him to have several heart attacks and strokes and was in a comatose state on life support. And it's a miracle that he even survived and he is still affected by it to this day. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, because it happened on Dennis Hoff's bed. And if you're worried that this is going in the direction you think it's going, that's totally valid because it's absolutely going where you think it's going. In this exhibit, Zach through the flat screen tells us that the details of this overdose are suspicious because Lamar swears he didn't do any drugs and witnesses say that Lamar was adamant on staying in the room as if he was compelled by forces we cannot see, which was just weird to me at face value, but then come to find out that when Lamar talked about the incident in 2019, he admitted to doing several drugs. As he put it, it was, quote, an unholy concoction of cocaine, cognac, and cannabis, end quote. And if you're like me, then upon learning that information, you might have gone, oh, okay, well, maybe the exhibit is just going off of the earliest information they had about the incident. Well, that's what you would love to think, huh? That's what I would maybe not love to think, but I would be more understanding if that was the case. But then when doing research for your critical video essay for your YouTube channel, like we all do, you find out that the bed has only been in the museum since 2020, a year since Lamar came out about the incident, two years since Dennis Hoff died, four years since the museum opened, and five years since the Lamar incident. What the fuck? It was already weird enough to see Zach grasping for straws to try to make this bed scary by implying that it tried to kill Lamar Odom, but then you find out that it's intentionally ignoring the admittance from Lamar to create this bad faith theory that some wannabe Hugh Hefner's bed is cursed. So, moving on from that exhibit, as me and Sage are walking to the next one and quietly going, that was honestly uncomfortable and kind of fucked up we enter the next exhibit, the Celebrity Hall. And continuing the theme from the previous room, there's literally zero mentions or correlations to the paranormal in a haunted museum, mind you. It is just a small room with glass displays holding items that belonged to dead famous people, many of which died tragically, like Sharon Tate, who was the murder victim of a cult, and Robin Williams, who died of suicide. And I don't know, Maybe I'm gonna be called a sensitive snowflake or something, I probably will be, but it put a bad taste in my mouth to have this tour guide explain, like, this chair witnessed the death of Michael Jackson, when it's just like, okay, now I'm just picturing Zach Baggins and a bunch of other people with more money than sense trampling over each other to get a piece of what was essentially a historic crime scene, like they're rats fighting over some leftover food that kitchen staff threw out of a restaurant. And you know what? I know I'm getting a little heated. Even if you don't agree that it's insensitive, agree to disagree. It can't be argued that something like the Celebrity Hall didn't fit into a haunted museum, which is again what we paid to see. And the last example of exploitation I'm going to get into is, I want to say the last or second to last thing we saw, which was a uh, mummified head. I don't remember the exact story of the head, sorry head, but what I do remember is that before we went into the room with the head, and for reference, the head was like in a display case and you kind of had to walk in, view the head, and then walk out. It wasn't like an open room. But I remember that before we went into the room with the head, we were told that the man that, you know, was the head didn't like to be disturbed or have a lot of attention on it or something like that. So when you go into the room, you can't talk. 
The irony was absolutely not lost on me that I had to silently walk through the room to not disrespect the dead's wishes for solitude, despite Zach putting him in a display with green LED strips for spook factor and also playing quiet, creepy noises for the ambiance, and also the entire concept of having this corpse spend its eternity on display for people to gawk at for 50 bucks a pop. Winding down this video, let's go back to those points that I told you to put a pin in. Did you put a pin in them? Because unpin it, okay? And if you didn't put a pin in them, I forgive you because I'm about to re-explain them. Firstly, the museum doesn't know what it wants to be. It's a mix of a haunted museum, a museum of death, and a haunted house, but it doesn't do any of these concepts well enough to stand on their own as their own. So you have this attraction that's promoted as a museum of haunted artifacts, but a third of it isn't haunted, and then there's a random-ass clown-themed haunted house you have to walk through. And funnily enough, the clown-themed haunted house is the most successful part of the museum. It's funny, it's scary, it comes out of nowhere, and it comes at a point in the tour where you're trying to estimate like how long you've been there since you can't check your phone, so you can't tell how long you still have to trudge through the place. So props to the clown thing, Zach. <laughs> and the second main takeaway from my visit to the museum is that it's less a museum and more so a place for Zach Baggins to brag about the weird, supposedly haunted items that he spent $300,000 on. Whenever he gives you an introduction to an exhibit, he talks in this tone like he's telling you the coolest thing you've ever heard solely because it's coming out of his mouth, and he spends more time talking about how he personally acquired the item, and of course how much he's spent on it, rather than why it's actually at the museum. And before I give my final note, I do want to list off some things I found in the reviews for the museum, because I looked at them when I was, like, writing the script for this video, because I wanted to see, like, if I was the only one that thought this, or if other people had issues with the museum. So here are some other critiques from reviews of the museum on Google. Despite my disappointment in the museum, I'm glad we went when we went, because all of the staff we interacted with were actually really cool, and it wasn't hot outside or anything, but a lot of reviews said that the staff was really, really rude, and in addition to there being basically no AC inside the building, they also had to wait outside the building in the Nevada heat for, in some cases, is around or over an hour after their reserved time slot. And there's also notes of it not being very handicap friendly, so if you're handicapped and after watching this you still want to go to the museum to experience it for yourself, then be wary of that. To conclude, at its best, it's a haunted museum with a bit of their background and an eerie ambiance to match, and at its worst, it's a two hour long Zach Baggins Ego Express that costs double its worth in both time and money. And that's Zach Baggins's Haunted Museum. I feel kind of bad for coming up here and just being like an angry hater, but as I was like writing the script for this video and re-remembering my experience at the museum, I was just like, damn. No, that sucked, and I feel like talking about it, because I, like, looked at videos on YouTube for the Haunted Museum, and what wasn't promo from Zach himself was YouTubers that either were paid or asked to go to the museum for free and were able to, like, free roam and dramatize their experience. So I feel like there's not a lot of reviews on this place, at least on YouTube, that are critical, and I don't think there's anything wrong with being critical, especially when it's a tourist attraction that costs $50. So yeah, that was this video. I hope you like this video. Uh, if you like the video, like the video. If you like the video, comment on the video. And if you like the video, subscribe to the video maker. Let me know how you feel about this video. Never reviewed a museum before, but um, I like it. I mean, you, you guys know that I, I like um, scary stuff and haunted places, so maybe I'll become one of those YouTubers that goes to those. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Thank you so much, and I'll see you later, and goodbye.